Hey folks, today I wanted to do a, a slightly different lesson. So we're not going to be breaking down a tune or working off a recording or doing a big history lesson or anything like that. Instead, we're talking about motific development and really more than anything, I just want to plant the seed in your head that it is an option. This kind of playing can really give your breaks kind of a subtle structure and really help avoid that lick factory hot sound if you're not into that. However, ironically, to teach this lesson, I am going to be using a lick that I wrote for the at Jazz and Grass account on Instagram. This is an account that I run with my friend Lyman Lipke, who's an incredible jazz guitar player. We post a new bluegrass lick every single day, except for Sundays, because Sundays are the day that our podcast comes out. So if that sounds like something that might interest you, please go give us a follow on Instagram and you can find the podcast wherever you do your podcasting. So to get started, what is motific development? Well, first off, if I had to give like a, a working man's definition of what a motif is, I would say that a uh, motif is a small group of notes that contains some kind of melodic or rhythmic significance that gets repeated throughout a piece of music. There's a lot of obvious examples in fiddle tunes. Perhaps a fun one to look at would be the small root to major seventh and back to the root note motif that exists in fiddle tunes like Temperance Reel and Big Sciota and Billy and the Low Ground. In fact, let's take Billy and the Low Ground. Let's talk through that melody real quick. All right, so if I take that beginning of Billy and the Low Ground, it sounds like this. Right, we were all familiar with that. But look at this beginning phrase. I have my root note, that's a C. I dip down and I come back up to C. And look, I do the same thing here. There's C, I dip down to the B, and I come back up to C. So this is a motif that happens multiple times in the melody. Now identifying these parts of a melody and exploiting them in our breaks by including them over different chords or putting them in other places where they wouldn't normally occur, that would constitute a motific development. Take for instance this video of Chris Thiele where he gets inspired by the pause in the A part in Temperance Reel and he develops a whole motif centered around inserting pauses and syncopation. You always want to find themes, you know, you deconstruct the melody and figure out what, <clears throat> what makes it it. So you might even, you might even just make that a theme of, an imp uh, of, of a solo. But I should point out that you can be inspired by your own improvisations as well. There's, there's no reason why something that you improvise couldn't be completely valid as a starting place to start the development. You see a lot of this kind of improvising in the more modern or progressive scene. For instance, if you put on a Punch Brothers record, you're going to hear a lot of this. They're going to take a motif and they're going to keep reapplying it and twisting it and repurposing it in really intelligent ways. This feels a lot different than your standard line of like never-ending eighth notes that we've come to expect and we normally hear in our bluegrass breaks. You can hear this dichotomy super clearly on recordings like the Thiele and Dave's recording, of course. Chris Thiele is going to give us more motific ideas and Michael Dave's will give us more of a traditional bluegrass feeling. Um, you can hear that too on the Julian Lodge and Chris Eldridge record where Julian Lodge is now giving us the motific ideas and Chris Eldridge is giving us more closer to traditional bluegrass kind of sounds. In fact, there's a really good example in Julian Lodge's Mean Mother blues break where he plays something like this. Let me do this. Now he plays the same rhythmic or melodic motif three times in a row, and each time he's twisting it to fit the context of the changes. And that's not even the only motif in his break. But of course, when Chris Eldridge comes along and he takes a break, we get more of that standard line of eighth notes that we're more accustomed to, probably because Chris Eldridge is trying to give us a, an opposing point of view to the motific thing that Julian Laws just did in his break. Now, a lot of times, uh, motifs get developed in much wilder ways than this, right? And like, the jazz and maybe blues worlds. Um, but in, in bluegrass, this straight kind of digestible development, it works really well in the framework that we have that's already bluegrass. Bluegrass is already set up this way, so it's nice when we use them this way. What do you think, Sushi Cat? Anyway, hopefully you know more specifically what we're talking about now, and you're ready to learn a lick that I wrote that develops a Doc Watson motif. <laughs> 
Now, I'm sure most of us know that little lick that's the A part of Black Mountain Rag, but if you don't know it, it goes something like this. If you've never played that before, definitely learn it because uh, it's a classic piece of language. And it's really fun to uh, drop it or hint at it in other tunes. It's like dropping a little Easter egg for the people that are really listening. And now that's exactly what I was doing when I improvised this line. So let me tell you a little bit about what was happening in my head when I first played that, so maybe you can adapt some of that mindset. So when I was playing this, of course, I wanted to drop some of this, right? Because I like that sound and I wanted a hint at it. Instead of playing that exactly, I put a twist on it. I went like this. Now, from that moment, I realized that um, I liked that phrase. That was a cool phrase. I was inspired by it. It became my motif. And I wondered if I could expand on it, if I could continue playing over the same chord, but instead of playing the exact same thing again, could I develop it? Could I move it along? And I came up with this. Now, the reason why I played that is because I know this is a lick. And I knew I could get a similar sound to the first one, if I went like this, and when I hit the root note, I could walk it down to the dominant seventh. By happenstance, I had these uh, these two phrases that I had learned before that now fit together because I improvised with them a little bit. And when I got to that point, well, I was in for the whole deal. I had to continue this, and so I went up to this shape. And once again, really good turn of luck when I was improvising, I realized that I had the third up here and I could walk my way down to the second, this minor third being an excellent passing note. So every single one of these times, I ended up with a chromatic phrase that I could walk through, which is wonderful. I'd wanna say that it was just good luck, but these things are built in such a way that you start seeing more and more of that as you play more and more. Now this phrase, is actually um, something that I got from a fellow YouTuber, uh, this idea. that kind of uh, descending phrase. It's a guy named Josh Cruz. You should check him out. I'm not sure if he's still making videos. Uh, check out Jay Crew. Um, that's, he doesn't go by that. I'm sure he's sick of that joke. Anyway, so I, uh, I realized that that would work. After I got to this point, I decided that it was time to let the motif go and go somewhere else. And at that point, an F chord was coming up. So I could land right on an F chord tone from this F chord shape. So the question becomes, with all this new information in your head, how can you begin to start making phrases like this on your own? All right, so the first thing we need to do is we need to get inspired by a phrase. Uh, I'm going to use a melodic motif, and for our rhythm, we'll just use the consistent eighth notes because it's bluegrass and that's kind of standard. So how about this? I really like this phrase. So that's gonna be our motif. Uh, then we need some chords to go along with this whole thing. So let's go with these guys. Big surprise, I know, G, C, and D. Really, wh what I wanna do is I wanna try to develop this motif over those changes. G chord, C chord, D chord, ending with a G chord again. So one of the obvious choices would be to just directly transpose this phrase for every single chord. So this is the minor third to the major third, something we talk about a lot on this channel. I'm going from the B flat to the B. Now we could find the third of the other chords. So for instance, in C, that would be our E flat to E, or for a D chord, that would be F to F sharp. So I could play something like this. Now, I think that's kind of uh, an obvious approach. There's nothing wrong with it. It's good. It's a good place to start. Um, something that might sound more interesting, something that I was thinking in my head while I was playing that first example, was that I could try to include this phrase and change it as little as possible to get it to work over all the other chords. So for instance, over a G chord, that goes into my third. Over a C7 chord, that would go into the dominant seven. And over a D chord, that would go into the fifth of the chord. So let's try that. And with 
with that example, we proved a point. We proved that uh, that half-step maneuver works over all kinds of different chord tones. It doesn't just have to be the third, apparently. So why don't we just try to do it everywhere now? Here we go. You, you could take that a lot of different places and you could you could go as far as you wanted with that. And that's just a starter idea. That's just a way to get into it. You don't have to follow those rules. These aren't hard rules. I'm just trying to give you I'm just trying to give you guidelines so you can get going on this kind of thinking. And like I said, you can plant that seed in your head that the motific kind of way of improvising is an option. All right, so if you like taking a lesson from me and Sushi Cat. Sushi. I mean, hopefully you like taking a lesson from the biggest, baddest billy goat in the barnyard. You can scroll down, hit that subscribe button, give this video a like, or leave me a comment. All the normal things that YouTubers beg for. Or you can go to my website, LessonsWithMarcel.com. There we have a bunch of blogs that you can read. They're about bluegrass, jazz music. Or you can check out the tab store. There we have a bunch of free tabs, some tabs that you can buy. Um, we also have merch there, t-shirts. You can sign up for Skype lessons. Um, I would really appreciate any of those things. They really help keep this channel going. And I appreciate all the support that you guys have already given me. Um, I'll see you next week.